Welcome to Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, founder of Backroads Coaching, where we pave our own path to self-acceptance. Think of me as your self-love bestie, here to guide you, support you as you let go, rewrite the thoughts and beliefs that are blocking you from loving yourself and living your best life. This season, we are talking business, pleasure, love, money, and of course, all things motherhood. This is a sponsored episode by Regila Beauty. As women, our skincare needs are constantly evolving and changing, so it can get a little confusing when we need a new item to fit into our existing skincare routine to tackle new issues. Regila Beauty has a wide variety of items that are built to fit into your routine, whether you have youthful skin, mature skin, you're expecting, or you're even a new mama. If I told you that you could enjoy these benefits without the inconvenience or expense of changing your current skincare routine, but just by adding something wonderful and affordable to it. Skin that looks and feels more even toned, firmer, hydrated, radiant, smoother, smaller pores. Well, Regila Beauty has the hydrating serum and it is that something wonderful that I'm speaking of. It is perfect for busy moms at any stage of motherhood, whether you're trying to conceive, currently pregnant, nursing, or preparing for an empty nest. Our serum is the clean beauty, fuss-free add-in you've been looking for. It's formulated to be non-irritating for even the most sensitive skin. It's full of beautifying botanicals featuring hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, and vitamin C, the ultimate anti-aging trifecta. It sinks right into your skin effortlessly between your current toner, moisturizer, without feeling greasy or sticky. It's unscented and also free of toxic ingredients that could harm your health. Get it today by visiting Regila's Amazon shop at amazon.com slash Regila, R-E-J-A-L-L-A, or click the link in the description box now. So season three is going to be, we're activating the pleasure portal. It has been divinely downloaded that for me and for us, that pleasure is really where creation happens. Pleasure is where we're as women able to receive what it is we need. And so that has to do with love. That has to do with money. That has to do with abundance. That has to do with sex. So yes, we are going there in season three. There is going to be no topic off the table for this season because I believe we grow from getting through the sticky, from getting through the sticky mud, the sticky middle is the only way we can grow and flourish and bloom and blossom. And so we're got to go. We got to go there. And so that's what we're doing. Three lessons I learned from the last season is that I get to go with the flow. One, I get to go with the flow. I get to really enjoy what I'm doing and really be in the moment with my guests. And that has been a game changer that I get to be me. I get to show up and be present and hold sacred space and magic happens. And that is why I love, love what I do so much. I love showing up on this show because it's all about just holding that sacred space. I guess I don't look back. I just keep moving forward. So this is a great opportunity to take a look back at where I was in season one with Everett on my lap recording podcast episodes as a brand new mom saying, I'm going to do this thing dirty and messy and I'm going to let that be okay. To now I am sitting here fully confident in my business that I'm building. I'm fully confident in my parenting. I'm fully just accepting myself in this chapter of like, I've got this and everything is going to work out just the way it needs to. And I believe that's a very powerful shift to be, but it's been a beautiful journey to get here to this place where I am asking for what I need. I'm ready to receive. I am allowing myself to be, to be open and just continue to be open. So through the things I've learned and implementing through the beautiful souls that we get to talk to on this show, my parenting hasn't really changed much because I always went in my parenting Everett with the intention that I am going to lead with love and he's going to be the teacher and I'm just going to be the witness of him growing. So still to this day, that is what that is what I do. I allow him to lead. And I believe he is teaching me day in and day out what he needs, what he, what he requires. And I just let that 
I just let that work. And so I'm very much a mom that goes with the flow of what my son is needing, my child is needing. And I believe that is sanity. That gives me sanity because we really can't control anything that they do anyway. We can't control it. And so when we can go from a place of true surrender, which I believe is not weakness, like spiritual surrender is just getting out of the way and letting life be what it needs to be in each moment. And the biggest lesson ever is teaching me right now is just to be present, be here. Like, what would it be like if we just dropped the story? What would it be like if we dropped the anxiety, the need to be perfect and just be present and allow the moment to just unfold? Let's hope that there's a baby in season three, because I would love, love to be a mom to baby number two. We got to talk to this with, with Austin though, because he's the, he's the holdup. Yep. I'm all for seducing your husband. I'm all for pleasure. Like we're talking about the pleasure portal. So let me tell you, like, we're talking about manifesting with pleasure. We're talking about all the things encompassing pleasure, not just in sex, but pleasure with food, pleasure with fun, pleasure with just going outside and feeling the sun on your skin, just allowing more pleasure in. And so there's definitely a difference between internal pleasure and external pleasure. For the longest time growing up in my 34 years, I was looking for pleasure outside of myself. I was looking to be stimulated by the outside forces, by what I was doing or where I was going. If I was planning something like that was pleasure to me. And now what I'm learning is pleasure is just being in my body and fully dropped into the true essence of who I am. Like pleasure for me is my morning practice of non-negotiable connection with self. Like that time just flies by. I literally have to put on a timer. I could be in my self for so long because it feels so good. And so there is a difference between what we see on the outside of ourselves as being pleasurable versus what we know it's like a deep knowing and dropping in. And I know it's kind of fearful when you first start dropping into yourself because it's something new. It's something we're not taught to do. And so go easy on yourself whenever you're trying something new. It doesn't matter if it's dropping in and meditating or learning how to cook or learning to be a mom, like all of it, it's called grace. We have to give ourselves grace as we're learning something new, but tapping into yourself and being very, very intentional with just getting to know yourself without the story is the best gift. We enter a room, let's say we enter a room and what do we see when we enter that room? We're tunnel vision focused. So you're going into the room to pick up your laptop. All you see is your laptop. You don't see anything else. And so when you are grounded in the fullness of the present moment, that is pleasurable because what then you don't, you're not tunnel focused. You're able to expand, like your eyes open wider. Like you're able to see more, you're able to sense more, you're able to feel more. And so in turn, you feel more pleasure. When I was a child, I definitely, pleasure was a, a thing I didn't even think about. It was a natural, innate thing. It was, you found pleasure in everything. You found pleasure in going outside, skipping, riding a bike, jumping, playing, being happy, coming up with your own imaginative, like, play like pleasure was just so effortless as a child and I was definitely a dreamer I still am I definitely was able to make something out of nothing and be creative in that way but as you get older pleasure becomes something that you have to sort out like something you have to make happen and for the longest time that's exactly it I would make pleasure happen by booking that trip setting something exciting to look forward to hanging out with friends like pleasure like those are all pleasurable things, but that was what was only thing that was pleasurable for me. And so then coming home to myself and coming to the knowing that I can create pleasure in each moment, if I only just allow myself to witness all the greatness that's around me, it brings you back to that playful pleasure, that playful focus, that playfulness that you had as a child. And so now it's just, it's a practice of seeing the joy and seeing the good and all the areas of my life. So pleasure is something that we, I think are afraid of because it can be very passionate. It can be very, I mean, the word overwhelming, like think of love, like love is pleasure, right? Think of love, 
the first time you held, like for moms, like the first time you held your child or the first time you found out that you were even expecting that amount of love, that amount of joy, it was almost like, it felt almost too much, right? And so with pleasure, we haven't been taught to hold a bigger capacity of that feeling. And so we shrink to it. So we think we can only have just a little bit. We think we can only just tap in. We can have a little bit of joy. We can have a little bit of pleasure, but not too much because you don't want to be greedy and there's just, there's not enough. But is that true? There is so much pleasure for us to witness. Like this world, this life was created for us to be filled with pleasure. I mean, you look at the flowers blooming, you look at the trees and the grass and all the nature in the world. And that is just for our enjoyment, like the ocean, the vastness of it, how beautiful it is. And that's pleasurable. And it was made for our enjoyment, but for some reason we think we just get a little bit of pleasure because we have to save it for everybody to get a little peace. But what I'm learning is we're allowed to hold a huge capacity of pleasure. Like how good can you handle it? And how good are you going to allow yourself to feel? Like it can be that good. And you're allowed to feel that good. The relationship between pleasure for men and women, I think <laughs> from what I've been observing with my this being a real practice for me and my husband, we're in this together with exploring pleasure and how good can we allow it to be in this relationship is I had to make the first move. I had to say that we are going to allow it to be this good and we're going to focus on the joys and we're going to amplify it. And when it's really good, we're going to name it. We're going to call it out. We're going to say, oh my gosh, this feels so good right now. Like you made me feel so good right now. That's that thing you just said brought me joy. And now that I've been doing it for a while and pointing it out, he's starting to say it. Like you made me feel so good. Like this feels so good. And so by voicing it and giving it voice, we're both getting to the place where we're both allowing more of it in. But I had to make the first move. Why are we conditioned to not feel the fullness of our pleasure? The thought that comes to my mind is growing up, like people like in the dark ages, even like they didn't have like pleasure wasn't an option. <laughs> like for a lot of our ancestors, pleasure was not a thing. It was survival. And so we have that survival instinct within us now. And so we're out there trying to survive here in 2022, but we don't have to survive like they did back in the day. We're not being chased by tigers. We're not living in cages. It's different for us. We've evolved past that, but we still have it innate in us. And so it's almost like you have to get through that barrier to get to the other side, to find that, teach yourself that you're allowed to have more pleasure. So the people that are not in the same position as me, as I am super blessed to be able to focus on pleasure, I do not take that for granted. I am super blessed that I get to focus on the ease and flow and fun of my life. And I get to amplify that for myself. And what I've learned is that the fact that I get to amplify the joy, the fun and the pleasure in my life, I'm doing it for the whole collective. I am not just doing it for myself. Like when I allow more joy in, I make the world a better place because when I go out into the world, I'm going out into the world in a higher vibration. I'm putting love out into the world constantly, always. And so by me doing my part, that helps the people that aren't able to do it for themselves. And the people that aren't able to focus on the pleasure because they have to focus on the survival of the day-to-day -day life is, I mean, that's, they have to do that. We have to, we have to be where we are. For a long time in my life, I was the light. I have to be the light. I just have to live in the light. I can't live in the darkness. I have to live in the light. And what that meant to me was I was always just the positive all the time. And people would comment, Josie, you're so positive. And I took it as such an honor. Like, yes, I am positive. No matter what happens to me, I'm just positive. But what I've learned is I have to get to my shadow as well. I have to feel the pains. I have to feel the lows. I have to be in all of it, the thick of it, the, the hard parts of it, knowing that there's a light on the end of the tunnel. Like my favorite acronym was hope is hold on pain ends. Like it always moves. Nothing is permanent. Nothing lasts forever. The good won't last forever. The bad won't last forever. So there is hope. The longest time, I'm not going to say being positive didn't serve me because it absolutely did. I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't do that for myself. That was my journey to get to this place that I'm at now. And I had to get strong enough. 
to be able to look at my shadows. I had to get strong enough to go into the deep and look at what was holding me back, what beliefs I was holding about myself. Like for me, the belief that I was trapped, the belief that I was not good enough, I wasn't cool enough, I wasn't impressive enough, I was bad. Those were beliefs that came up for me that I had to confront and I had to go in there and hold. I had to hold that belief because there was truth to it at the time that I lived it. And I had to give it a voice. I had to let it be witnessed and seen in order for it to lose its grip. And the more I am willing to look into the darkness, the more gold I find for myself. Because I, each time I shift, each time I become lighter, the more I heal the younger versions of myself, the more enlightened I become, the more joy I find, the more pleasure I find, because I'm able to welcome all those parts of me to the table. Like right now I'm working with like teenage Josie, like I'm going to be right there, honest and transparent. And she was a passionate rebel child. <laughs> she wild. <laughs> I love her to pieces, but she was wild. And so she scared me. Her wild tendencies scare me. And so what I do, I just pushed her down. And I became this version of myself that I constructed to fit in, to blend in, to be tamed, Josie, because it was a, it was better for the palate for the people. <laughs> but now as I reintroduce her to myself, because that's what it's about. It's about looking at her and getting to know her and holding her because the reason she was a rebel, the reason she wasn't contained, the reason she had to be so wild to be, because she wasn't being heard. Everybody was saying, you're too loud, you're too much, you're too passionate, you're too this, you're too that. And so she had to get loud in order to be heard. And what I'm learning from that part of myself is she was direct and I lost a lot of that. I became very timid. I became very much say what I need to say to make people feel good a certain way. You're too direct. But she was direct and to the point and she asked for what she wanted. And as I journal with her, as I journey with her, like her thing is she gets what she wants. She always gets what she wants every time she's going to go after it. And I love her. Like, I like, oh my gosh, I'm so in love with her. I'm like, where have you been? She's like, I've been here the whole time. Like you just didn't give me the floor to speak, to see, to be seen. And so we have to do that work for ourselves to reclaim the little parts of ourselves that we just left in the different chapters that we were in. Like, it sounds so wild because it's not something that we are taught. It sounds so strange that we have to go back and reclaim those parts of ourselves. Well, we do, we most certainly do. And so I've worked with little Josie and now I'm working with teenage Josie. And I just am so thankful that I'm able to look at these parts of myself and welcome them home, welcome them back and use the parts of me that gets what she wants. Like she has that power to do powerful things and make powerful shifts in the world and now use it with the knowledge of all the experience I've been through and really give her that like container. Now finding your true voice and finding your confidence has to start with you knowing who you are, knowing what your voice is. So sitting with yourself, journaling with yourself, going out in nature with yourself, like truly being transparent and honest with yourself asking yourself, what is it that you believe? And that's what a coach, I mean, you can't see the stuff on your face unless you look in a mirror. You need somebody who's gonna give you feedback, who's gonna reflect back to you what it is that you're saying. Because we say we want something, but then there's a the very part of us inside that says, but when we did that last time, that hurt us. So we're never gonna do that again. So we come up with a belief that ah, hurt me last time, so I am never gonna do that again. And so then we are a grown up self. We say we want something, but we made a belief back in the day that we were never going to do that. And so we are hitting against walls. We're fighting with ourselves. And so what a coach does for you is the coach helps you see those beliefs that are blocking you and hindering you from doing the very thing that you say you want. And so honestly, the biggest shifts I've ever had is from working with my coaches. I have multiple coaches and mentors that I work with to uncover these beliefs because there's no way I could do it myself. I would be completely lying if I said I just sit here and these beliefs come and I just deal with them. No, I need to sit and I need to talk about why I'm not doing the things I say I want to do and get really honest with myself to figure out what I'm going to do moving forward. <laughs> Investing in yourself is a must. We do it when we go to college. We decide we're going to get a degree. 
and we decide we're going to put our money where our mouth is and we're going to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for an education. But then when it comes to living the life of our dreams, we don't think we need to invest in that. I don't, that doesn't sit well with me. I think we definitely need to invest in our knowledge of ourselves and growing ourselves because it's only by growing ourselves do we get to create the life of our dreams. And it's hard to do it yourself. You need a cheerleader, you need accountability. Like accountability and community is almost like your guarantee that it's gonna happen. Because when it's left to yourself, it gets put on the back burner. It gets left for some day. But when you have somebody that is constantly reminding you of what it is you want and helping you take the steps to get there, that is your guarantee that you're gonna do it. The greatest thing I heard from one of my clients is like, I don't go to the gym unless I pay for it, but I'm not going to pay for it because I don't have the money to pay for it, but I really want to go to the gym. Do you hear that? And so by paying for the gym, you're going to show up. So by paying for something that you really truly want, you're going to show up and you're going to show up in a bigger way. That's why they say, put your money where your mouth is. And so the first thing is knowing yourself. So when you know that you're not going to go to the gym unless you pay for it, that's already a belief you've made for yourself. So that is your belief that I will go to the gym when I pay for it. So by paying for the gym, you're telling yourself, I will go. But then that's when the blocks come because you've made a belief with yourself in the past where you said, I don't like to go to the gym. I don't like to work out. And so you have to find that belief, that block that is going to stop you from going. Because yes, you can buy the gym membership, and go for the first few days, the first two or three days, and then never go again. And so working with the belief, finding the belief that's stopping you, blocking you from going in the first place, like what is blocking you or stopping you and what is going to motivate you to go? Like what's the accountability that you're going to set up for yourself? Like that is what a coach does. The coach is your accountability that helps you each time. Like you get, you hit the wall because you are, you're going to hit up a wall. Each time you go to try something new, your body is so used to being where it is right now that it doesn't know the new thing. It's an unknown. And so it's going to bring you back to what is known. And so you have to have the person who's going to shine the light on when you're hitting that wall that can help you like dig a little hole so you can get through the other side until the next wall comes. Cause it will, it will always come. Like the bigger you grow, right? <laughs> the bigger you need to get, <laughs> get help so that you can continue to grow in a bigger way because we are constantly expanding our consciousness, our awareness. And so when we expand, we need to expand our beliefs, expand our thoughts, expand our emotions to match what it is we say we want. Because all day we can sit, we say we want a million dollars, but if you believe you're not worthy of receiving a million dollars, how are you gonna do it? Like if you think I'm only worthy of receiving a hundred dollars, that million is gonna be so far away. But having somebody who examines that belief of why it is that you believe that, and how is it hindering you and blocking you, and thinking of what new belief can you be having that's gonna help you, and then brainwashing yourself with that belief. So I'm all for reprogramming your mind because we are in charge. We are in charge of our conscious, of our subconscious mind, our conscious mind. We get to reprogram, we get to write new beliefs for ourselves, but we have to know what belief is stopping us before we can put in a new program because that new program will never work if we're still believing something old. So your truth, you only see the world through your truth. Like no two people have the same truth. Like we can look at our president let's say, and say, we see two different, we see two different humans. One of us might see a compassionate human being. Another person might see an arrogant human being. Like we see what we see with our eyes because it's our filter. It's our upbringing. It's what we've been through in life. It's all of it. And so our truths will never match another person's truth. That's why you can't walk in another person's shoes. And so that's why you have to start with what it is that you're believing to be true. And is it really true? So how I help clients do that is I do it through embodiment work because I believe the body is holds the score all day long. So even when we don't consciously know, like I can ask you a question and you can think, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer because you're in your head. Your body knows the answer. So if we can focus on where you're contracting and we can start to pay attention to it, we can start to give it voice. We can start to give it emotion. And then the beliefs follow. So our body, for me at least, and my clients that I work with, what I've really come to notice is that 
we can have our mindset set in a certain way, but our body overrides even our mindset because it is deeply rooted beliefs and it's a lived experience. So you live that contraction, you live that pain. And so when you come to embodiment is it helps you relax and it helps you loosen the grip. And so a lot of embodiment practices and mindset, the two and two together are the game changers. And that's the work that I do with my clients in Backroads. Embodiment work is for everybody. Embodiment work is just getting grounded, tapping. Embodiment work is allowing yourself to feel open, feeling the wholeness of who you are, feeling your body, becoming the person who does the thing is what embodiment, like to embody is to, be, to become. So when you say you want this dream, goal, or desire, you have to become it before you can manifest it in the present. You can't just dream of this dream and then be that person where you are right now. That is just not possible. You have to 100% transform. You have to 100% become the person who does the thing, who has that dream, that vision. And what are they believing to be true? What is their self-concept of themselves? Because what you believe about yourself is as far as you will go. And so if you can change what you see and you can change the concept of yourself, that's when your world starts changing for the better. Thank you for being part of the self-love movement. Your support and care matters here. Please be sure to subscribe, review, and share. And get your ultimate daily planner freebie today by visiting makelifefunpodcast.com. When you're ready to step deeper into my vibration and work together, go to backrosecoaching.com. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.